let's get into it. My name is Ryan Lavelle. I am the director of capital markets at Chainlink Labs. I've uh, been at Chainlink Labs for about two years now. I have a traditional finance background. I used to work at Vanguard for about 10 years. Um, while I was at Vanguard, the, the plumbing to me was far more fascinating than uh, boring old passive index funds. So um, since about 2017, I've been working on trying to bring use cases into blockchains and different ecosystems, um, and I'm excited today to present to you. So I think we can start with one of the biggest value propositions in why you would use a blockchain and how we see the, the evolution of capital markets on chains. So one of the biggest values is having data connected to value. So in traditional finance, um, typically an asset is separate to the data. You might go to a Bloomberg terminal to learn about the asset, where the asset's sitting in some separate system. So the first stage in really generating high quality tokenized assets is the combination of data that's connected with value. So when you think of value, you can think of interfaces. So a popular token interface would be, let's say, ERC-20. And within that token, which is value, there are functions. So now you have a modular interface where you can create value that's programmable. So value becomes data containers. Data containers need value. And that's just a superior asset. You can program assets for ongoing data, ongoing conditional statements. You can learn things about that data. One of the second really big phases and, and, and innovations is the merging of the assets and payments all into one system. So in traditional finance, you know, the payment system, Fedwire, ACH, they're, they're all sitting in a separate system. Um, securities are, are sitting in also separate systems. So we think about blockchains, you can merge the payment side and the asset side all into one system and exchange them atomically which is very efficient. If you add the first two components, you get to the third component, which is basically a global internet of contracts where we see a lot of the value moving to. So when it, when it comes to Chainlink, we like to frame things in building tokenized assets with three key challenges. The first key challenge is data. So if you're building high quality digital assets, they need data. And at Chainlink, you know, we've delivered over 12 billion data points on chain. We've enabled over 10 and a half trillion in transactions in data. Um, types of data that assets need are ty types of data such as identity, uh, proof of reserve. Um, if it's a tokenized fund, it needs NAV data. Um, if you're building a derivatives type of product, it needs price data for mark to markets. Um, that's really the first key challenge in building high quality assets. Um, and it gives them utility. I think over the past several years, tokenization has just been about just putting a balance on chain. Great, you have a balance on chain. Why don't you do something with that? So data really adds composability to tokens. It allows you to build different additional services on top of them. The second key challenge is finding the purchasing power for these types of assets. And I think if you go back to 2017, 2018 era, everyone thought there would only be two or three blockchains. Well, that hasn't exactly happened. And partially that the reason that hasn't happened is the, the cost of developing your own personal chain, um, such as Hyperledger Bezu, has gone down significantly. And this is very similar to how the database industry has evolved, where first you might have needed to hire a PhD on staff to get a database up and running, and it might take you several weeks to get that database up and running. Now people can spin up chains in one or two clicks. Um, it becomes very easy. So 
there also hasn't been um, solving this this trilemma problem within blockchains: decentralization, security, and scalability. So what has happened is there's been a lot of replicas that have been built in the ecosystem. No one has actually solved the problem. They've just created different layers of the same technology. Layer two, layer three. They're even talking about layer four. Um, so part of this problem is if you issue an asset on one chain, you need to find buyers and sellers on different blockchains. And part of that is interoperability. So that asset first needs data for composability, but second, interoperability to create a, an asset that has full liquidity and mobility throughout different blockchain ecosystems because that technology is constantly changing. The, the final stage and the final challenge that we'd like to highlight is how this asset, as it moves across chains, stays synchronized to additional off-chain systems. So if you created a tokenized fund, if it's getting NAV data off-chain and you've moved it to blockchain B, that NAV data is coming off-chain from some fund accounting system. That asset needs to stay synchronized to that off-chain system as it moves across chains. So stage three is all about the, the synchronization problem. And that's how we frame you know, how to build high quality assets um, and some of the problems that we're solving at Chainlink. So at, at Chainlink, you know, we, we've had a lot of success um, in the DeFi community, first by bringing prices on chain. And that has spurred just an amazing amount of growth in DeFi. Um, the next stage of just bringing data on chain has bring bring additional services. So such things as trust minimized computation through some of our different products. But the final thing that we've released is CCIP, which is the cross chain interoperability protocol. So what you can summarize with this this slide, which there's a lot of things on this slide, um, is that we've built a global standard of different products that service assets around data, around computation. Um, I'll give you an example, automation. Smart contracts are typically asleep. Someone must click a button to trigger them. Um, we trigger them in automated ways. Um, and then obviously CCIP. So just to walk you through some examples that we've done in the industry. So what we're highlighting here is ANZ Bank. Um, has about 1.1 trillion in assets under management. Um, what they wanted to do is take two blockchains, a source blockchain and a destination blockchain, and enable a person on the buyer blockchain to send a stablecoin all the way over to a different blockchain, buy an asset, and send that asset all the way back to the originating wallet. And we were able to achieve this in one single CCIP message. So this is what we call programmable token transfers, where you can actually send value between different chains, but also give it instructions, such as go to blockchain X, smart contract Y, function Z. And in this use case, it was originating a stable coin on the destination chain, burning it, on the source chain, minting it on the destination chain, going to A and Z's smart contract, going to the delivery versus payment function, swapping it for a carbon credit, burning the carbon credit, minting it on the source chain, and sending it all the way to their wallet. So this is a valuable use case if you're an asset manager and you'd like to maintain your users and wallets within your ecosystem. But it also provides instructions and value on the same type of interface. So this is, this is a very, very powerful concept. Um, and this is essentially cross-chain DVP. This is something that we accomplished last year um, with ANC. So looking at CCIP from an architecture perspective, it's not just burning tokens and sending arbitrary data and instructions back and forth. 
We also have a very modular interface that allows for additional security as it relates to policies. So if you're a token issuer, if you want risk limitations and right rate limits on your token transfers, so let's say you issue an asset, you'd only like to move, let's say, a million dollars between chains at a certain time, you can program that into the protocol. Say you're using some form of on-chain ID, you only want to pass tokens between two addresses that are fully KYC'd and fully AML, you can put those types of, of checks into the protocol. Um, the other key benefit that we have in the CCIP protocol is we use the existing Oracle networks that have been in production for many years now powering DeFi. We have three different Oracle networks that sit between source and destination chain. The committing DON and the executing DON are pretty much straight off the shelf Oracle networks that can reach consensus, just like our data feeds do. The third network is the introduction of risk management. So this was built by a different team at Chainlink. It uses a different code base. Um, it uses a different set of node operators. And what it does, it, it has the ability to check both sides of each chain to ensure that any anomalies occur. It would halt any type of token transfers between the two. So 2022 and 2023 weren't a great year for bridging. There's been a lot of hacks. I think over 2 billion was hacked. Um, a lot of those protocols never had this idea of risk management, a, a third system sitting on top of um, an already decentralized system. Another aspect of bringing assets on chain is that we consciously know that there is a lot of value on existing systems that capital markets use today. And that value is not going to be moved off of those systems. So the, the way that we see it is we'd like to give those existing messaging standards that have existed. And by the way, Swift, Swift has existed for 50 years. Finance has changed, obviously, many, many times over 50 years. You know what hasn't changed? Swift. Why is that? Well, number one, it's a standard. And number two, it's highly secure. Kind of sounds like Chainlink. So naturally, um, we worked with Swift in enabling the same financial messages that they send today to instruct custodians to move cash or value. We pointed those same messages, changed the instructions a bit, but instructed the movement of value through different blockchains. So an existing bank or asset manager can use the applications that they use today to speak to traditional finance, but give them additional connectivity and interactions by connecting them to blockchains. And we see this as a huge unlock as we continue to work to SWIFT to have a lot of these large institutions be able to connect and move value through their existing systems. So going back to CCIP, um, you know, we worked with a lot of large infrastructure providers like SWIFT, like DTCC. Sergey was just on a panel with, with Euroclear. Um, we see this as the same way that TCP IP has connected the internet and allowed data to move between different servers as a way to connect global central banks, um, banks within each region, to allow them to do payments and value at a global liquidity level. If you look at traditional finance today, if someone wants to issue a security, it's only jurisdictional. To move it to, let's say, America, to Europe, it might take you 30 days and some faxing um, to send that asset over here to enable them to buy it. But if these banks over here are running different technologies and different blockchains, and these are running different technologies and blockchains, CCIP is being the TCP IP and connecting that data and value to enable a security from a United States issuing company to issue that globally and allow demand to be aggregated across the world for that asset and seamlessly travel between the different blockchains. So how we see things today, 
um, going back to that large meta layer slide, um, we have a lot of different services that connect the Web3 world through DeFi protocols.